Well, in the estimation problem, we observe some data x, and we want to identify or estimate a parameter that was responsible for producing that data. And the question is, how do we choose some function of the observation to estimate that parameter? We're going to look at some criteria here in this particular lecture. So in general, we're going to assume that our observed data x depends on the unknown parameters, which we'll call alpha, through a probability density function. That is, some observation x is distributed according to the probability density function f of x, and will explicitly indicate the dependence on alpha after a semicolon for our notation here. So what we're trying to find is an estimator, alpha hat, which is some function g of x. And the question is, how can we choose a good g? Now there are many different possible approaches to this. The two perhaps most common criteria that are used in signal processing are maximum likelihood criterion and then the Bayesian criterion. In maximum likelihood, we are given observed data, say x naught, and then we plug that data into the probability density function and try to find the value of alpha that gives a maximum value for the probability density function. So our estimate alpha hat is the arg max or the value of alpha that maximizes this quantity. This particular approach assumes that alpha is a deterministic quantity. It's not random, but we just don't know what it is. Now the other common criteria is the Bayesian approach, and in this case we try to find the posterior probability density function. In other words, how does alpha, probability density for alpha, depend on the data x? And this particular approach assumes that alpha is random and it requires us to specify a prior probability density function f of alpha. So let's motivate the maximum likelihood approach first and if I can write down the expression for the probability of observing some data x in the vicinity of x naught and since we have this probability density function f of x and depends on alpha, I can graph that and if I observe some, if I have some value x naught and I want to understand what's the probability of getting an observation in that neighborhood, that's just the area under the probability density function. So if I take some distance delta and I can integrate from x naught minus delta over 2 to x naught plus delta over 2, the probability density function with respect to x. And for delta sufficiently small, I can approximate this probability as f of x naught semicolon alpha times delta. In other words, it's just the value of the probability density function at x naught. So what we do in maximum likelihood estimation is try to find the alpha that gives us the highest probability of observing some value x naught. So what I have to think about now is that I'm going to think of my probability density function as depending on alpha, and I'm going to substitute the observed value of x, say x naught, in there. So these are a set of numbers. There's no longer any dependence on x naught. In other words, we've plugged in our particular x naught, and that gives us a function that depends on alpha, and this represents the probability of observing this value x naught for a particular alpha. And so then what we're going to try to do is find the particular value of alpha hat that maximizes this probability. And that's what the maximum likelihood estimate uses because it's based on the maximum over alpha of f of our observed data semicolon alpha. And of course the size of that maximum is f of x naught comma alpha hat. Now why do we want to use this maximum likelihood approach? Well it turns out it's fairly straightforward. You just have to specify the prior model f of x comma alpha or semicolon alpha and then it becomes an analytic or numerical optimization problem once you observe the data. And that's a fairly straightforward thing to approach. Now
the optimization may be a difficult optimization problem, but nevertheless, conceptually, it's fairly straightforward as to how to proceed. The second reason for choosing the maximum likelihood approach is that the maximum likelihood estimate has some very nice asymptotic properties under rather general conditions. And we're not going to go into details of the specifics of the conditions that are enforced and how these properties come about. But basically, as the number of measurements approaches infinity, and that's what we mean by asymptotic, you can show that the maximum likelihood estimate is unbiased. That is, the expected value of alpha hat MLE is equal to the true value alpha. And you can also show that as the number of measurements gets very large, that the maximum likelihood estimate achieves the smallest possible variance of any unbiased estimator. Now, there may be other estimators that have the same variance, but there's none that are guaranteed to be better. And so this is a nice property and it tells us a certain measure of goodness of the maximum likelihood estimator. Now these again properties only hold as the number of measurements gets large so for finite or small number of data samples the MLE may not be particularly uh, optimal. Now the basics behind Bayesian estimation are that if I'm given a model for my data, in other words, how does my data depend on my unknown parameters, and a prior probability density function for my unknown parameters, I can find the posterior probability density function, f of alpha given x, so in other words, I say given x because I'm going to assume that I've observed some x at this point, and now I want to find out what is the probability density of alpha given that I observe that particular value of x, and we call that the posterior. And this is accomplished by using Bayes' rule. Because Bayes' rule relates these various quantities. It says that the posterior conditional probability distribution, f of alpha given x, is equal to the prior, or the model, f of x given alpha, times f of alpha divided by f of x. And a lot of times we don't need to know f of x because we can uh, simply use f of x given alpha times f of alpha and make sure that we normalize this to have unit probability over all values of alpha and that'll take care of the uh, f of x division here. So once we have this posterior probability density function, it tells us how likely particular values or how distributed alpha is, given that I observed this data, I'm going to try to find my estimator as a value alpha hat that minimizes the average of a non-negative cost function of the error between alpha hat and the true value alpha. So we can look at some specific cases here. If I assume that my cost is the mean squared error, then I can write that as the magnitude of alpha hat minus alpha squared. It turns out that under that condition, your maximum, your Bayesian estimate alpha hat is going to be the mean of the posterior probability density function. So what's the mean value of alpha? And that will minimize the mean squared error. We can do other things as well, like look at an estimator that minimizes the mean absolute error and in that case our cost function is just the absolute value of the difference between our estimate and the true value and you can go through the math and show that in this case your Bayes estimate is going to be the median of the posterior density function f of alpha given x and then one other estimator that's often used is called a maximum a posteriori estimator and that often is just motivated as the value of choosing the estimator that maximizes the posterior probability density function but that also corresponds to a particular cost function which says that the cost is one if we're not equal to the true value and zero if we are equal to the true value if you try to minimize this particular 
average cost, you end up with choosing your estimator as the maximum of the prior or posterior probability density function. Now, why take this Bayesian approach? Well, one advantage is it is possible to find the true optimum estimators. Like if you want an estimate that minimizes the mean squared error, the Bayesian approach allows us to try to do that. Another advantage of the Bayesian approach is that it represents a very powerful framework for incorporating prior information. If I have physical knowledge based on some constraints, like I know that a parameter has to be positive or that it's very likely to be in a certain range, then I can incorporate that information into the prior that I use when I compute the posterior density. There's also a lot more flexibility than we've hinted at. So this is, leads to a very powerful framework. The challenge with the Bayesian approach is that it can be difficult to find this posterior density function. And then, of course, if you're wrong about your prior, you then you're pushing your estimator toward a wrong direction. But the Bayesian approach, as well as maximum likelihood, are often used in signal processing, and they lead to some very, very useful estimators for parameters of interest.